Hi, good evening. We are getting ready here for Trout Tank 2015 at the Denver Metro Chamber of Commerce Small Business Development Center. This is our exciting evening where we have four incredible entrepreneurs who are going to pitch in front of our school of 30 bankers and lenders. I'm going to briefly introduce them to you before we start our event this evening. Corbin, can you come over and introduce yourself to our wonderful audience of millions of people from around the world? Fantastic. Millions. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, millions. And hopefully those are millions of dollars that we're going to give. Absolutely. So Corbin, tell us a little bit about what you're going to pitch tonight and what you hope will happen. Well, I've got a, a really exciting opportunity. It's in the uh, a wireless space doing uh, uh, mobile device uh, repair and accessories. And uh, we got a, an opportunity to go into uh, Walmart locations all across the country. So over a thousand locations are available. And so we're looking to, to get the first five to 10 locations going right here in Colorado. And what's on the line? How much are you looking for? Uh, tonight, we're only asking for 400 grand. He said only. I just want to make sure y'all caught that. <laughs> but ultimately, this is a $70 million uh, rollout. So uh, 400 grand is where we're going to start. We're going to get the first four, you know, five to 10 locations up and running, uh, work out all the kinks, and then go big. That sounds great. Oh, Corbin, we wish you the best of luck, and thanks so much for being with us this evening. You can uh, go ahead and take right. your seat and get ready for the show to begin. Thank you. And then we're going to have Chris Rogers. Hi, Chris. How are you today? I'm great. Good. So Chris is here, and she is with Spinelli Sauce Company. Chris, can you tell us a little bit about what you're pitching here this evening? Well, I'm pitching our amazing products, and we are growing rapidly, and we need more money to saturate the entire country with our delicious pasta sauces and dressings. The entire country, and I can just imagine... The, the world. The world. Yeah, and this sauce is really unbelievable. And, and Chris, what are you going to be asking for tonight as far as dollar amount is concerned? We're asking for $150,000, and, and we're looking for an investor who can bring their expertise and really help us grow. So Chris is really looking for a true partner this evening. And what you're going to find when you watch our show is people are looking for different things. They're looking for debt or they're looking for equity. They're looking for partnership, advice, and we're going to create those bridges this evening. Thank you so much, Chris, and we wish you the best of luck. And then we have Greg. Um, I kind of, you know, have a little heartthrob crush on Greg because if you can't tell just by looking at him, he's kind of, you know, he's fireman. So fireman, this is what I'm saying. So introduce yourself. Tell us what you're about. So uh, my name is Greg DeRocher. Our, I'm CEO and co-founder of our company, Safe Ride for Kids, and we are in the kids and car seat safety world. And our goal is to uh, take really innovative products and get them out to parents uh, along with great education. And we're here looking for some funding to help us expand not only our inventory, but our education and product offering. That's incredible. And when you watch, you're going to see Chris's talk is, um, Chris, sorry, Greg's talk is going to really touch your heartstrings because the safety products that he's talking about really do save lives and save lives of those we haven't yet met. So that's really exciting. And uh, I'm excited for your pitch. Good luck. Awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And last but not least, we have Chauncey. Hi, Chauncey. Hello. How are you feeling? I'm feeling great. How are you doing? I'm incredible. So <laughs> tell us all about your exciting venture that you're going to pitch this evening. Well, we're starting up a company called Familiar, which is a board game lounge here in Denver, Colorado. It combines uh, board game retail and rental and fast casual dining. Fast casual dining and board games. What more can you want out of life? So Chauncey, where did this idea come from for you? Uh, for me, this came from a, uh, just a desire to have all the things that I love together in one place. Yeah, and food, games, friends, right? Food, games, friends, family, people having a good time, laughter, all the good stuff in life. How much are you going to ask for tonight? Tonight we're asking for $250,000. All right, so brilliant. If all this money gets funded, wow, what will this do for the Denver economy? Who will walk away with the big prize? I don't know, but we're going to find out in about, oh, three, four minutes. So hang tight, and we'll be right back with you. Thanks for joining us on Trout Tank. So thanks for coming, guys. This is our second ever Trout Tank, hosted by the Denver Metro Chamber of Commerce and Denver Metro SBDC. Um, here at the Chamber, it's, we run a lot of programming. We do it day in, day out, all year long. Um, for example, our Leadership Foundation puts on top of the line <clears throat> leadership development and community building programs. Our SBDC does small business technical training, and we also do a lot of connections and networking events. We have the Colorado Competitive Council. Jeez, kind of is nerve wracking. Uh, <laughs> I'll get over here. So I'll just get started again. Thanks for coming. This is a huge opportunity for us as a chamber. 
it's not necessarily rare for us to bring a program together like this, but to have the kind of support that we have throughout the community, it's really fantastic. We have over 100 people here registered, over 200 people registered tonight, and we have an overflow room downstairs to handle it. We're actually streaming this live through Google Hangouts, and so it's a great, it's a fun event. My name is Abram Sloss, and I'm the executive director of the Small Business Development Center. Um, I work for the SBDC in the Chamber of Commerce, and it is really hard to explain how fun it is. You can tell how excited I am. Um, you know, Child Take just isn't about access to capital. This is actually really about the environment that we've created for small businesses, the support that we have for the, for the, the ecosystem that we have for small business and the entrepreneurial community. We have four entrepreneurs tonight that are gonna be speaking, and I will try to stay away from that. I'm gonna stay away from the idea of explaining who they are because we have Daphna, Michaels, and Janae. Uh, who is much better at this than I am. And I'll get, read this real quick. Daphne is an alum of Leadership Denver, where right after she finished, she took the charge of leadership and traveled to all 50 states. Uh, she uh, in one year collecting and sharing the stories of ordinary people. And she, uh, her book is actually at the corner, and it's titled, It Takes a Little Crazy to Make a Big Difference. And it just won the 2015 International Book Award for Social Change. Everybody, I'd like to invite Daphna Michelson Janae. <laughs> Poor Abram. <laughs> I'm so I'm sorry. One -on -one. <laughs> No, Abram's incredible one-on-one, -on -one. Um, but we, there, there's a reason. Hey, hey, look, by the way, my husband's in the back over there, so whatever, this is all gonna be on the up and up, just so we're clear. So since we have that very reverent beginning, welcome to Trout Tank. We're so happy that you're here. <laughs> Big clapping, yes, 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 get out your energy. So why are we here? So um, I think it had something to do with Aaliyah having a conversation with Abram about, hey, we need to do something kind of shark tanky. And um, what's Colorado like? And we're not really kind of sharky, although that's not to say that we're not as amazing or as incredible, but we're more about the trout, right? And why the trout? Excellent question, I'm so glad you asked. By the way, did you know that the state fish for Colorado is the cutthroat trout, right? Okay, the cutthroat trout, that makes sense. But we are less of a cutthroat community and we are more of a, how do we give everybody an opportunity to succeed? Because as the Small Business Development Center, as part of the Denver Metro Chamber of Commerce, our job is to create incredible opportunities for business in our city and in our state, and that's what we do. And I found this excellent article in the Harvard Business Review, totally not joking, all about trout in the Harvard Business Review and how trout help swim downstream, but they always find the little trout that's not doing as well and they get around the trout and they make the path and together they help that trout succeed. That's what we do. The little trout, the big trout, the medium-sized trout, the trout that wishes she could have lost another 15 pounds before this event, all of those trout are the trout that we help when we are here for Trout Tank. So how did people get here? We have these four, <clears throat> they're kind of bait or they're anglers. We haven't decided, wave over there in the ta tank. That's our tank. Um, I thought about building an actual like swimming pool thing, right? That would have been good, yeah? Yeah, okay, next time swimming pool. So you guys are the last ones to stay dry during the event. Um, they, these participants, three of them at least, did the Leading Edge program and the Pitch Academy, and um, uh, or were in business for a certain period of time beforehand. So we open this up to the community. Who wants to learn about being a business owner? How can we help them get before our school of 30? Um, and what skills do they need? What tools do they need to be able to be a viable business to be funded? Right? We want to put people who are in front of people who are going to give money, who are pre-qualified, in essence, to get that money. We're trying to help them get there. You guys, who are our awesome school of 30, are the ones who can teach us what it is that we're missing in between. You can listen for what our presenters have to say and then tell us how we get there. So what are the rules of play? What's going to happen this evening is the four contestants each have five minutes to pitch to the school of 30, and I'll get to that in a second. 
five minutes. And by five minutes, I mean five minutes, not five minutes and 13 seconds. Five minutes. I told them to not make me look mean because I'm really nice, but I can look really mean. So they have five minutes to pitch to you. And then there's going to be 10 minutes of Q&A. So what kind of questions do you have for them? If they're in the traditional environment, what are they going to be asked? What holes didn't you hear answered? Or what do you want them to think about before they end up in front of you? These are the questions I want you to think about. And of course, whatever questions you guys do when you're in your kind of offices and with the money, right? You have all the money sitting around your desk, right? OK, because I was expecting trucks with, no? OK. Um, anyway, so let me talk about who's in the room today. Today we have our, what I call the home stream. Forgive me if I do a little kind of watery trick, trout, you know, fishy stuff. So we have our home stream, which our home stream is, of course, the Denver Metro Chamber of Commerce. Thank you so much to the chamber for having us here today, and Kelly, who will give us our final greetings, my little hero over there. Um, and we have the Metro Denver Economic Development Corporation, the Denver Metro Chamber Leadership Foundation, the Colorado Small Business Development Center, and the C3 Colorado Competitive Council. That's our home stream. Great, what does that mean? That's a lot of really pretty logos. We are the people who go to your businesses. We support business. We create opportunities for business. We allow that water to flow appropriately. That's our home stream. And then we have the School of 30. The School of 30 is a very special uh, a group of people who are made up tonight of 15% equity investors, VCs or angels, 25% non-traditional lenders, and 60% debt lenders representing the banking industry. So what you have here in front of you is a wide range of ways that people can get money to do business. That's the simple piece. This is where we get the money to do the business. Um, last time, if anybody was here, I made somebody whose phone went off fund the presentation that was, right? So um, you might want to check your phone. Don't turn it off because I want you to tweet a lot during this event. And you'll see our hashtag right there, Trout Tank. And on the screen, this is our School of 30. So a round of applause for our awesome School of 30. <laughs> then we have our audience. Our audience is a key member of our community because our audience is the one who goes to these businesses, who's going to be the end user of the products that you see, who's going to be able to taste this unbelievable, really, not even joking, incredible pasta sauce, and play the games that you're going to hear about today. You are our community. Tonight, you have a job. There is a role for the audience in this evening. And there are a number of ways that you can do that. Um, number one is we have a mobile app that you can access by going to www.tankevent.com with the entry code Trout Tank Guest, capital T, capital T, capital G. What you get to do there is you have a million dollars. They're not real, but there are a million of them. Each of you has been given a million of these not real dollars that you get to allocate to the company you think deserves it the most. Okay? You don't have to allocate all million to one company. You can spread the wealth. However, there will be a winner this evening, and that there will be a cash prize. And how awesome would it be if we actually raise a million dollars for that cash prize? So who here wants to contribute a million dollars for our cash prize? You guys are, you know, you can do it. I'm just, Cedric, did you bring your checkbook? <laughs> oh. Cedric was in my Leadership Denver class, by the way, the most benevolent class ever. So as the most benevolent banker ever, I so know that money is coming from you for the cash prize. I have it right in his pocket. Right in his pocket. Excellent. Well, that's wonderful because you can go onto our website, bit.ly, bit, so bit.ly link, bit.ly, Trout Tank Pledge, whether or not you are in the room, because all of you millions of viewers out there in Google land, you've got the money. Throw some our way, because one of these incredible business owners is going to walk away with the prize tonight. But who's going to really walk away with the prize? Every single one of us. Because our job at the SBDC is to help each of these businesses get funding, not just one. And why, why do we do a prize? Because it's awesome to win a prize. Who doesn't like to win a prize? We like to win a prize. So this is an opportunity for us to give a little something back to our small business owners and our entrepreneurs who are very creative. And then we get to have the success of being able to access their businesses once they come into the community. So we are going to try something. We have an overflow audience. Believe that? 
which is a really great big deal, and thanks to Aaliyah Kilgore, really. So a big hand for Aaliyah Kilgore and all the work that she did to make this event. She's like, wait a minute, I didn't know you were talking to me. So what we're going to try to do is see if we can hear the 400th, the boardroom downstairs, cheering. So Kristen downstairs knows that we're going to do this. They're on about a three-second delay. So all right, downstairs, let's see if we can hear you cheering. They just heard the message. No, we can't hear them. All right, so you guys cheer and clap and applaud, and let's see if they can hear us. Big applause. Right, because we've got the spirit. And I would like to call up now our presenting sponsor, Mike O'Donnell from the Colorado Lending Source, to tell us why this matters to him. So Mike, please join us upstairs. OK, let's see. Um, where's that handheld mic for Mike? Ah, handheld mic for Mike. I'm going to keep away from you so we don't give feedback. It's nothing personal, I promise. <laughs> I, I hear that a lot, don't worry. Uh, why am I here? Uh, good, good evening. Thank you for letting me come here tonight, too. My name is Mike O'Donnell with Colorado Lending Source, and Daphne and Aliyah and Abram have limited me to 10 fish puns and one cheese reference, but <laughs> my, and you can count them. My purpose tonight really is to um, <laughs> celebrate the small businesses here in Colorado and really the access to capital that's so badly needed with small business in Colorado. Colorado is the best state to start a small business, to grow a small business, but it's the state that we really want to make the best state in the United States for. That's a very poor answer to your question. Would you like to ask something or should I just ramble on for a little No, while? I don't want you to ramble on. Yes. I want you to talk about, um, you have a particular business model or business owner that you're looking for. Can you talk a little bit about that and how, how your company serves that group? And just by quick overview, for those of you who don't know Colorado Lending Source, we're a private nonprofit economic development organization. We really play a lot in the small business administration fish tank. So we work a lot with SBA type financing. Uh, we do a lot of SBA 504 loans, uh, which are loans that businesses might look at when they're ready to own the real estate they operate out of. We help currently 42 community lenders in the state do SBA guaranteed 7A loans. We also have our own direct program where we make community advantage loans to businesses who cannot get loans from, other, from banks or other financial institutions. And then we have a little program called the Colorado Mainstream Program, which is really intended to help businesses who can't get financing anywhere else. And those are really character-based loans, early stage startup projections, the ones that have the most difficulty accessing capital in this state and in really any states. So my interest is really working with businesses of all sorts. Um, under the 504 program, we work with large manufacturers. Under the, under the Colorado Mainstream program, we work with very small early stage startups. So I'm here to cheer everyone on. And again, I've got eight more fish references. So OK, good, because I have one more question for you, because you mentioned character. And I know that character is a really important component for you when you're fishing and you're seeking out you know, who you want to couch. Uh, talk about that a little bit, please. That's good. Well, I'm glad you, we're, not, we're not talking about anything crappy here, which is really cool. <laughs> um, oh, my. <laughs> The issues we have today and the challenges why so many early stage small businesses can't get access to capital is of course we've got a regulatory environment now where regulators tell me, they tell you, that it's not safe and sound lending practices for traditional banks to make loans to startups. Uh, we also have issues with the millennial generation which have a lot more debt now than their predecessors. So we have challenges with people who have a lot more debt. That doesn't really make them very, uh, make it accessible or very easily accessible to get into the traditional or even the SBA type financing. So character lending is something that used to exist for people my age and, and, and one or two of you who might be older than me. <laughs> um, you know, there's no one here from Davy Jones's locker. So no, no, right sorry. Um, <laughs> So character lending is just something that really appeals to me. I would really like to bring back more character lending when we make loans to businesses based on who they are or character referees or information that we get from, from people that they interact with. And, and really, those are the loans that used to work when I was little or when my dad started his business back in Australia. And those are the loans that can work and do work, but we have pressures that prevent people doing a lot of that now. Uh, smaller banks have a little bit more flexibility than bigger banks, but still regulators put pressure on them if you're making loans purely on the basis of something that's not quantifiable. 
Well, I've got lots of people with lots of great character to send your way. And okay. audience, if you would like to reach out to Mike, you can do so through at Colorado Lending on Twitter. Um, and please do keep paying attention. We have Twitter handles and our hashtag on every single slide. So tweet out what you're learning and what you're hearing. And if there's somebody that you want to meet tonight, this is one great way to do that. So a big round of applause for Mike and Colorado Lending. <laughs> All right, uh, <clears throat> fish bait, how are you feeling? You're feeling good? OK, because we're about to get ready and begin. Um, we're going to start by thanking First Bank, who is our pitch sponsor this evening. The money that First Bank contributes to this helps the organization or the business owners to get ready to stand before you by bringing them together with the Rockies Venture Club and providing the funding for our education series called Leading Edge. So if you would like to find out more about how you could get trained and potentially be up on this stage, um, you just need to access information from the SBDC website and thank First Bank for making all of this possible. So a big round of applause for First Bank. So I'm going to call up Greg DeRoche, I'm going to say your French name the way that it should be, who is with Safe Rides for Kids. He is our first contestant tonight. Um, I have a little girl crush on Greg because Greg, well, he's a firefighter. I'm just saying, so I have to have a little girl crush. I don't, we're not going to make you do any kind of calendar or posing or anything like that tonight. <laughs> Um, but here's the really cool thing about Greg. He and his wife outfitted, completely built their own truck to fight forest fires. So Greg and his family have been keeping Colorado safe for a really long time. And as Greg starts to go in and tell you why he's here this evening and you listen to him, know that it comes from a place of he cares about all of us, all of our homes, and all of our children. Thank you for all of that you do, Greg. And I'm turning it over to you, five minutes on the clock. It's a typical weekday morning at the fire station. The alert tone sounds. Engine seven, medic seven, respond on a motor vehicle crash at the intersection of Alameda and Sheridan. Report of parties trapped. The time, 0835. When that goes off, the questions start to run in your mind. How bad is it really? Are they really trapped? It's a weekday morning. I hope there aren't kids involved. This scenario plays out 10 million times in the United States, resulting in 37,000 fatalities. 400 of those are the children, the innocent victims. Then that doesn't count the 3,000 pregnancies that are lost in these motor vehicle crashes. The reality is, is that driving with our children is the most dangerous activity that we do with our children on a daily basis. All 50 states require, by law, that children be restrained in a certified child restraint system, which has led to a $300 million industry here in the United States. The sad reality is that 85% of those child restraints are not installed according to manufacturer's instructions. Now, I know of this because, as Daphna said, I was a firefighter paramedic for 18 years. And not only that, but I've raised my three kids up through all the different stages of child seats. And when I realized early in my career that if I was going to be in the life-saving business, I had to be involved in injury prevention. That means going upstream to education. So I got involved as a, or got certified as a child passenger safety technician, teaching parents how to keep their children safe in the car. Two and a half years ago, I co-founded Safe Ride for Kids. Uh, our company brings parents innovative safety products and quality education to help them get their children from pregnancy all the way through to using the adult seatbelt system in amazing products with accurate information. Currently, we have two core products and an amazing uh, offering of education and information, which we use as part of our inbound marketing strategy, which means that our company can get the traffic off the internet of people who are looking for the information that we have at a much lower expense than your typical marketing system, keeping our overhead low. How big is the market? In the United States, there are four million children born every year. If you picture that most children are 
in a, some sort of a child restraint system for at least 10 years because they don't start fitting in the adult seatbelt till somewhere between nine to 12, that's 40 million children in child restraints at any given point. One area that's not addressed very well is this stage of development, the pregnancy stage. This seatbelt system was not intended, was never intended for pregnant women. Who can see a problem with this scenario, right? Our company, Safe Ride for Kids, is proud to introduce to the US market from Australia, as a matter of fact, the Tummy Shield, which is a uh, crash-tested seatbelt positioning device for pregnant women, removing the, the portion of the lap seatbelt uh, to the legs, which makes it more comfortable and safer. Who has seen this person at the airport lugging their car seats on vacation with them? Who's been that person? I have. What if, or, so child restraints, there's not only a huge selection and variety on the market right now, which is very confusing, they're getting bigger, bulkier, and heavier. But what if all that you needed to take on vacation to keep your child safe was a vest that the child wore, which properly positions the vehicle seatbelt system? That's the Ride Safer Travel Vest. It's a certified child restraint system that we've been marketing for over two and a half years and we've been getting some pretty good results. Just in 2015, quarter two of 2015, we are on track projecting through January or June to exceed $150,000 in revenue, which is more than double our revenue of this of the same quarter last year. And where are we going from here? Over the next five years, we anticipate reaching the uh, over $11 million mark in revenue. Who are we? We are four individuals, everybody, each one of us with unique skill sets, and we met in an environment of volunteerism. We also have built a team of experts around us to help us implement and develop an even more uh, complex, or, uh, <laughs> thank you, sir. Um, so what we're asking for is $350,000 in a loan or line of credit uh, to help bolster our inventory and uh, operate, uh, increase our operating capital. And do we have any questions? Good job, Greg. <laughs> Big round of applause. <laughs> so poor Greg had to go first. Somebody had to go first. <laughs> so he broke the ice for all of us. One more round of applause for Greg, because amazing job. Now's where we turn it over to you. So we only take questions from the School of 30 unless there's time afterwards. We will also be receiving a question, um, at least one that's coming up from the fourth floor. So someone's gonna come upstairs with us on the fourth floor to give you a question. But I first wanna turn it over to our School of 30 and see who wants to break the arc. First question, okay, JB. Thanks very much for sharing that. Great story and congratulations on your success so far. Thank you. Do you have any kind of exclusivity with respect to uh, the products that you're selling right now in this market? Yes, that's a great question. We are the exclusive U.S. distributor for the Tummy Shield, which is the seatbelt pregnancy positioner, and we're in the process of negotiating exclusivity with the Ride Safer Travel Vest manufacturer. Okay. Yes, sir. Can you pass around your... Anybody would like to yeah. look at it? I'm going to have him pass around that little car seat because that's pretty awesome. Go ahead, Matt. Uh, the vest is certified for starting at children three years old and 30 pounds and up. There's two sizes that go from 30 to 80 pounds. So the idea is that the vest will take them from three years and 30 pounds up to fitting in the adult seatbelt system. Yeah, 80 pounds. I have a uh, son who turned 13 today. Um, he weighs 72. So I'm just saying he could be in that <laughs> in his wedding. <laughs> so, <laughs> true story. Uh, okay, next question. Yes, go ahead. Yes, sir. Yes. How, can you elaborate on that? Sure. The question was um, elaborate on our inbound marketing strategies. Um, one, using SEO and content based marketing um, allows you to find the people who are looking for the answers that you offer. And that's a really um, e commerce based method that gains trust in you before they even become a customer. Yeah. Yep. And I just, I ask because it seemed like with e-commerce, with that model, that it would be a price sensitive, I mean, you're, you're playing at a price 
sense for business if you're trying to offer the value of the education and the expertise, so how do you kind of compete in that price world and leverage the educational approach and create a, a method to do that? Yes, we have uh, created a method to do that. And the Ride Safer Vest uh, is retail 159 so in the car seat world, car seats go up to 800 bucks. So it's actually a very competitively priced product. And we consider the tummy shield, uh, the pregnancy one, is baby's first car seat, which we can coin to uh, Nancy during the leading edge class. Um, at 169 retail, and we have a monthly rental program for that. So our, 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 we want to make them as accessible as we can. Please do try to repeat the question because the yes. School of 30 doesn't have a microphone and we want our people in Google land to be able to understand, to know the question. Copy. Okay, Understood. next question. Uh, can you talk a little bit about your competition as far as the larger players and what they're looking for? You know, the tummy thing seems like a pretty unique uh, product, but where are the larger players coming in? Sure. So the question is um, to elaborate on our competition in their product space. Uh, particularly so the larger companies they don't have any vest products out there there's one other vest but it's primarily for school bus and special needs uh, so from the uh, conventional car seat world as far as the vest is concerned there's not really a lot of competition uh, the direct competition to the vest is the booster seat um, which there are features of the vest that make it safer uh, we're lowering the center of mass of the child we're spreading the crash forces around we're positioning the, the seatbelt on the child with a clip. So there are some safety features that we feel that the vest is a better solution. Um, and for the tummy shield, there, as you acknowledge, there's really not that much in the space. Um, it's a very innovative place. Yes, sir. I will. Um, the question or the request was to elaborate on the growth projections as far as the two different products go. Um, right now, the vest is accounting for about 98% of our sales, but we just got our first inventory of the tummy shield a few months ago. So we're right now, as I speak, ramping up our marketing and website for the tummy shield. And our anticipation is that we're going to the vest is going to continue to account for the majority of the sales in the near term, but be superseded by the tummy shield over the next couple of years. Other questions from the School of 30? Yes. What are the plans to go into uh, retail um, rather than just doing it online? Our primary, our initial stage is to do the online to build the awareness. Because both products are so innovative, we felt like we had a lot of grassroots education to do. Um, to that point, the vest has been around for about 10 years and was, com was not very well marketed. Um, it was on store shelves and didn't sell because there wasn't the education that went along with it. So we have really made an effort to distinguish ourselves through the education side of it. Um, and um, I'm forgetting your initial question. I apologize. <laughs> Oh, the plans to get into the into retail, correct. With the vest, uh, we're going to have to see how it goes with the manufacturer. If we get exclusivity and then what kind of price points we can arrange, it may very well stay online uh, for the foreseeable future. But we are also selling on Amazon, which is, as you know, a huge uh, re our marketing space. Um, with the Tummy Shield, we anticipate getting into maternity stores as our first uh, target audience, and then potentially the Coles and the targets that are looking to bolster their maternity sections. Uh, yes, sir. How is the, a uh, two-part two question. Okay. How is the company owned? Is it an LLC or some other structure? I want to follow on to that. The question is, how is the company owned? What's our structure? We are an LLC at this time with four owners, uh, the Lobeck, Jeff and Stephanie, and my wife Amy and I at this time. Consider, you might look into being a B Corp because okay. given what you're doing, the kind of social mission part of what you do could be attractive in that context. Okay. And the other Thank one is you. if you poured tie on votes, who wins? Uh, we have it in our operating agreement, uh, a method of breaking a tie. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. That's a very good question. Yes, thank you. All right. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> so for those who have four-legged children, <laughs> um, you know, I've been asked that a couple of times, and my understanding is there are products on the market. I haven't actually looked into that yet, but it is actually a real uh, concern that those uh, pets in the vehicle do need to be restrained because if nothing else, for their own safety, but also for your safety, they become a projectile in a crash. It really concerns me when I see people driving with their pets on their lap Oof. because that's not a good interaction with the airbag. No, poor Fido. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm, ha I'm having panic attacks. I'm thinking about my dogs. Yes. Yes, um, we are going to increase our uh, pay-per-click advertising as part of that. We're going to be running print ads in specific maternity-focused uh, magazines, and we're going to be doing, um, there's a lot of websites, uh, communities that have uh, the opportunity to advertise with them, but they charge a lot <laughs> to get your ads with them. Uh, so those are kind of three main areas where we really want to start focusing on the tummy shield. Um, there is some additional crash testing that we'd like to get done as well. That would be about $25,000 of that as well. Um, and the primary reason for that is the manufacturer of the tummy shield in Australia doesn't have access to all the data from his crash testing. So we want to do our own to validate it here in the U.S. Okay, and we have two questions from downstairs that Aaliyah is going to deliver. Awesome. Thank you. And the fourth floor would also like to request that you repeat the questions, yeah. Daphna. Ah, I know yes. he's been repeating them, but um, I think it would help to Great. Have you repeat. Great. I, I Thank will you. be the question repeater. So a couple of these questions from the fourth floor have already been answered, um, but they want to know, do you have a warranty? Is there a patent for the device? Is it safety tested? So I'm assuming that they're referring to the tummy shield, the pregnancy one. Um, there is a warranty period. If if the product is involved in a crash, we will uh, overnight express you a new one to ensure safety for any future uh, travels. We, it has been crash tested um, to ensure that the seatbelt functions at least as well as it's currently designed to, which as I mentioned in the presentation, was never intended for pregnant women. That technology hasn't changed since about 1945 when it was first invented. Yes, I, 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 I'm well aware. I. <clears throat> might have, you know, ran a red light a little bit because it turned really fast when I was pregnant <laughs> and I didn't want to slam on the brake because I was really concerned that I was going to do damage to my child. And, uh, of course, that's when the cop is there. I mean, I'm just saying. <laughs> you know, in Colorado, everybody goes through the yellow. Don't do it. It's not safe. Thank you so much, Greg. Did you want to say something? If there's, I can offer one more detail yep. on the tummy shield. It was actually invented by a gentleman uh, who was an engineer and a father, and he invented it out of necessity. He has a 19-year-old daughter who was born with a traumatic brain injury mm -hmm. and he from the seatbelt injury, and he went on to develop the product that way. All right, well, I say let's make some safe pregnancies and okay. safe deliveries, and thank you so much, Greg. Thank you all. Big round thank of applause for Greg. All right, so are we getting the flow of how this is going to go? Um, Greg was a great first contestant for us. He worked really hard in that presentation. And um, we're going to get through it, and we're going to get to our next sponsor, Mission Yogurt, who is a member of the School of 30 and has a very interesting role because they're a different sort of uh, business investor, if you will. Um, and Rod Tafoya really began when he was hanging out at the airport when it was back in Stapleton and wanted to get things going, wanted to come up with an idea for a business in the airport and then heard about this whole DIA expansion and decided to go for it. And you have to hear this story because it was one stumbling block after another after another. And really, this man should have quit and got a job. But nope, that's not what he was about. <laughs> not at all. He was going to make this work. And he did, even after going through $6 a day earnings, right? We can't do anything on $6 a day earnings. Um, but he made his businesses work and so successful to the point where he is now creating an environment for other businesses to come into DIA in the hospitality uh, arena. So thank you so much for the sponsorship of our yummy food and for being a part of the School of 30. We're really glad to have you along. And it is no 
mistake that they are the sponsor for the segment with our dear friend Chauncey Hutton. Come on up here, Chauncey. I'm really excited for you to meet Chauncey and learn about his business and his business idea, and I'm not going to tell you about it. But I wa what I want you to know is when you are listening to Chauncey, you are listening to a man who has deep respect for his peers and specifically for women in his space, which I found fascinating. And when I did my pre-interview of him, I was needling him a little bit about why women, why women. He's like, I don't know. I just, you know, I don't like the way that they're treated and they shouldn't be treated the way that they're treated. And I'm needling him and I'm needling him. And he has a sister who's much younger than him, who he was kind of the overseer of and who he loved very dearly. And until we really talked about it, he didn't make that connection that Every woman is his sister. And so while his business is not specifically about women in the space, it's a part that underlies and makes him the really decent human being that he is. So please let us hear from Chauncey Hutton. Five minutes on the clock. Clap for him. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I love going on after Greg because I love talking about a great place to take your kids once they're all strapped in and safe. You walk up to the door, you hear the sounds of laughter even before you walk in. The door opens, the smell of great food comes into your nose, roasting vegetables, honeyed chicken, maybe some of that brisket I have in the oven out there right now. You go, so you grab some of that food, you grab a drink, you sit down with your best friend who shows you this crazy board game you've never played before, but it's such a good time, it's such a blast, you pick up a copy of it because you need to take the fun home to your family. This is familiar. And we exist because we want to bring your family together around a table. Now that might be your family that you're born into or that's born to you, that might be the family that you choose. But we want to have that because we believe that families these days are being pulled apart. And they're being pulled apart by distractions, lots of lights and noises and everything flashing at you all the time. And we think it's better to have a shared experience, a mutual appreciation for the tasks that are ahead of you and the tasks that are at hand. To that end, we want to be the, the place that you come to. We want to be the venue for that. We offer a fun and casual atmosphere. We have quality food, board game sales and rental, and a family-friendly environment that all members of the family actually want to go to. We are building off of a business model known as a board game cafe. Uh, I went to one recently out in Boston. It was fantastic. About half an hour after they were open, it was filled with kids playing chess of all things. Their parents were in there having conversations, drinking coffee. And this is all fueled by what the Boston Globe recently has referred to as a golden age of gaming that is coming across the country. We believe that Denver, Stapleton specifically, is most ready to be taking part in this golden age. And we believe that they are because a 2012 customer expenditure survey is showing us that they are already spending lots of money in our related fields. Now, this is because we have people who have established these markets already. Yes, there are board game stores. Yes, there are fast casual dining places. But there's no really combination of the two. The closest we get are places like One Up or uh, Punchbowl Social, which if you guys have spent any time in Denver, you've seen just thriving wonderfully. It's a lot of fun. And people want to go to these places because they want that fun. They want that shared experience. They want to be able to strap some silly crane to their head and pick up stuff. <laughs> I'm working on getting a copy of that game right now. You <laughs> don't see it up there. And they're willing to pay for this experience. We've got your families of birth, as I mentioned before, such as Marge has. Uh, it's a very active family. They're looking for a place to get all of their people that they love together and have just a quiet downtime together with them. You've got maybe Lenny and Carl, who are the family of choice. They choose to be with each other all the time, and they want to have a place that they can be social and they can have a good time. You also, of course, have people who just love the individual products and want to be able to express their passions. These are like comic book guy. So how do we talk to these people? Well, social media is huge for us. Uh, those are places where communities are built sort of outside of the four walls of a traditional establishment. There are also niche events like Genghis Khan, Tacticon, Denver Comic Con. I like to say any place that has the word con on the end of it and there are a bunch of nerds there, that's where we want to be talking to those people. <laughs> there are other venues for us, of course, but we really want to focus on the community ones because community is so important to us. So this drives us towards some pretty great steady growth in our, in our industry. And we're seeing that based off of the, the projections that we've already seen uh, through 
various uh, industry reports. And you know, we're also hearing a lot of people that we talk to tell us about how excited they are to go to a place like this. So I've said we a lot. Who are we? Well, I'm Chauncey. I have 18 years of food service and sales experience. I am currently the deli manager and head of safety for Marzik Fine Foods here in Denver, Colorado. Woody Hearn is my brother from another mother. He <laughs> is 16 years of uh, web development experience. He currently owns and operates GU Comics, which is an internationally recognized uh, web community. But uh, we can't do it alone. We need money to get us there. So to that end, we're needing $250,000 in debt or investment, which will help push us down the road towards our ultimate goal of family fun and world domination. <laughs> Any questions? Good job, Chauncey. Hey, round of applause. <laughs> 30 seconds to spare, dude. <laughs> I mean, that's some good timing right there. Well I, done. I and do by can. the way, his partner did all those graphics. Um, how awesome were those? <laughs> yeah. So we told Chauncey that he was more likely to win the money if he brought samples of his food. <laughs> so. Yes, there is some coming out right now. I saw people duck yeah, out so of the Yeah, so if you're in the Here school of 30, you're about to get samples. So if you're not in the school of 30, I'm sorry. Your tummy can grumble along with mine. Um, <laughs> be lucky, be happy you don't have a microphone because not everybody gets to hear your tummy grumble. But school of 30, he is trying to butter you up, just so we're clear. Or he's trying to brisket you up. trying to you brisket up. you up. Yeah. yeah, so we're going to brisket you up. I don't know why he didn't bring Rocky Mountain Trout. Yeah, I'm just saying. That was a, that was a horrendous oversight. Yeah, tremendous. <laughs> OK, we'll let him answer questions anyway. All right, what questions do you have, School of 30? And I'll try to repeat them correctly. Yes? Uh, you talk about the revenue model from food sales, alcohol or beverage, and then games. How are you thinking that's going to play out? OK, so how is the revenue model from food, food sales, beverages, and games going to play out? Uh, well. It's going to play out in some really fun ways. Uh, specifically, we're looking at uh, the, the revenue from food being a, a large driver for us, as well as rental of the games uh, will drive a lot of the revenue. The board game sales themselves are not a huge piece, but they are a very exciting piece, and they tend to have uh, a much better sort of investment and excitement behind it when people actually go after it. Um, that having been said, if we're looking for a specific breakout of the percentages, I have that number somewhere. I don't have it memorized off the top of my head, but I definitely can present that with you if you like. So be sure to give him a card. Yes, please. And he'll get that to you. Excellent. Um, next question. Yes. Okay, so based on a $30 per visit ticket, what of that is going to be food, rental, beverages, et cetera? Uh, so you're looking at about uh, two thirds to 75% uh, food and uh, the rest game rental. Does that answer your question fully? Great, next question. Yes. Oh, excellent question. Will you have to quit your job, um, or can you do both? Well, my bosses are not in the room right now, so I'm not going to make <laughs> eye contact quit. with them. <laughs> um, my plan is to uh, stay working for this company for as long as I possibly can um, before transitioning full time into into this uh, venture. And you have four people lined up to work with you. Is that correct, or three people? Uh, well, three and Woody. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah. Woody's like a guy and a half. A guy and a half. <laughs> Woody's a guy and a half. All right. Uh, next question. Yes. Tell me a little bit about, you've got some uh, real estate build out in here. And so what, what, what kind of space are you looking for? How big is it going to be? OK, let me repeat. Um, can you please talk about the space that you're looking for, how big it will be based on the information you gave on build out in your slide? Uh, we are currently looking for about 2,000 square feet for our build out. Um, there's some restaurant equipment that will need to go into that space. We can run a kitchen out of a, a very tiny um, area, uh, especially in a production sense, uh, in that we are fast casual and we're more buildable model. Um, we don't need to do the full service type of uh, cooking. So that really kind of tightens up the, the restaurant or the kitchen environment. Uh, I made all this food right here on um, a range at my house. 
So, and then I kept it at food safe temperatures all the way here. <laughs> you guys are all fine. Our, our food safety manager there. Okay, so what is your plan to compete with Punchbowl Social, who, who is also going to Stapleton, as you are considering doing? Uh, well, that's a great question. Um, Punchbowl Social is a great place. Um, our specific uh, plan to compete with them is really more to focus on the family-friendly atmosphere of it, as opposed to the sort of go hang out with your guys kind of place. We will still be that. Uh, obviously, the later we go into the evening, the fewer children will hopefully, if there are good parents in the area, <laughs> not be showing up. Uh, but yeah, we are focused more on developing a, a familial space, a, uh, a community space, as opposed to just a party space. Oh, we definitely will serve alcohol. <laughs> and will you be serving alcohol to children? Trick question, don't answer that. OK, <laughs> next question on the floor. Yes. So um, I have four kids ranging from 18 all the way to eight. And so the question is, can you describe the games that you will sell to the, kid, sell to the kids and or have the kids play with or in the game if you get them to go to your, your location instead of a competitor? Excellent. So Trey from First National, you might remember that name because I said it already this evening, sponsor of our next Trout Tank event, um, would like to know how your games are going to meet a range of ages. His children are ages 8 to 18. And what kind of games are we talking about? Well, I have a lovely selection of games over here for you to, t <laughs> for you to see. Uh, I Honestly, I could talk to you for like three hours about what kind of different games we could play. Um, some of the most common ones that you see are... Um, Games like Magic the Gathering or Dungeons and Dragons are two of the biggest like game retailers out there. Uh, they also have a, a high uh, iteration, multiple iteration rate uh, as far as purchases go. Uh, as far as what different kinds of board games we can have, uh, two of my favorites that come off the top of my head for kids. Uh, I play uh, with Woody's kid all the time a game called King of Tokyo, which is about giant monsters fighting uh, in the streets of Tokyo. And my personal favorite game, which is up there, by the way, this is all from my board game collection, is a game called Euphoria, which is a dystopia building game. Uh, and that's a little bit more geared towards the older crowd. Hey, for your viewing pleasure, Euphoria. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent, yes. How do you compete against the game consoles? That's an excellent question. I'm glad you asked that one. It's rampant. We see it with a lot of families. It's easy. Yeah. Uh, well, competition with the game consoles uh, provides a very different uh, interaction rate or interaction style. Um, it becomes very person versus object. Um, the appeal of board games and the things that drive and draw a lot of people to board games is first and foremost the social element of it. You are having a conversation with the person you're at the table with, uh, the shared experience. Um, you know, that having been said, I've played a lot of I've played a lot of video games. Uh, I have probably broken out in a flop sweat over board games faster than I have over uh, some of these games. I think that, you know, especially a game like Pandemic that I have up here as well. Um, is a great way to get that, uh, that heart rate going up um, in some really fun ways. Pandemic is really creepy. If you haven't played it yet, you get to like kill people through viruses and whatever. My children love You try it. to save people from dying <laughs> oh, through whatever. viruses. Oh, whatever. That's not how my children play it. <laughs> <laughs> OK. <laughs> Next question. My people right here. Ah, how do you compete against the dining room table? Uh, well, I don't know that I entirely want to compete against the dining room table. Uh, to some extent, I definitely will, because this is there's food here, and it's great food, as I'm sure you guys are noticing. Uh, mm. And you know, we want to have people to, to come in and, and uh, enjoy our environment uh, and the food that we have there. Uh, but if we can send people home with, with games that they're enjoying in their personal space uh, and who can talk to, the, talk to their neighbors and say, you know, um, I, love the, I love the comfort of my own home, but man, those guys pointed me in the right direction with Lords of Waterdeep, like you mentioned, and my whole family loves it now, that, I consider that a win.
Interesting. And I'll, I'll say that from a parent perspective, the dining room table time uh, can be really challenging as your kids get older and life starts getting a little bit harder, you know, because you've got that span from 8 to 18. And if you can get those 14, 15 year olds playing a game, they actually start talking to you, which is amazing, amazing <laughs> thing. Um, sometimes you want it, sometimes not so much. <laughs> okay, next question. Next question. Yes. Okay, so will 2,000 square feet allow you to reach the volume you need to reach your sales goal based on ter table turnover? And what is your table turnover? And what is your table turnover rate? Average length, average length of stay. What is your average length of stay? So average length of stay for us is about 30 to 45 minutes. Um, and that is actually accomplished through a lot of, uh, a lot of games have a very short time period. Uh, you can play a couple of rounds of, um, Oh, what's the game? Now I'm totally blanking on it. Uh, Cards Against Humanity, um, before you know, before your drinks have arrived, maybe. Uh, that's not true. We're way faster than that. <laughs> um, but they, you can. There are a lot of games, smaller box games, um, you know, rapid fire kind of party games that you can play very quickly um, and have a lot of fun with, and then be done with by the time you're done with your food. And what do you expect your turnover rate to be? Um, about 30 to 45 minutes per table. 35 to 40, 30 to 45 minutes per table. Okay, questions from downstairs. From Miss Aliyah. What have you personally invested so far? Mm. What's your skin in the game, man? Uh, my skin in the game uh, so far has been um, putting money towards uh, the lawyer uh, fees that we are, uh, you know, that's just part of it. Um, I also have developed a big uh, collection of games that will be going into stock there as well. Uh, and besides that, um, I don't have a lot of money spent already, but I'm sure I will be spending a lot more in the, in, uh, the coming years. Excellent. Big round of applause for Chauncey. Great job, Chauncey. I wasn't joking. I really thought pandemic was about killing people off because that's how my kids play it. So I'm going to have to go home now and read the directions. <laughs> so, okay, you learn something new every single night. Okay, so here we are going to our next sponsor, who's our technology sponsor. And they're the ones that created the awesome app that we've given you a million dollars. A million dollars, don't you all feel really rich? Because I'm feeling really rich right now. Um, that Because that's a million dollars you're gonna invest in a business tonight. And Brainspire was our um, technology sponsor for our first Trout Tank as well. And we are extra grateful for Brainspire. And I'll say it again, go Brainspire. Um, <clears throat> our next contestant has a big, huge brain. Um, and what she found is that she really liked a sauce. A sauce, I'm, I'm like sauce, not saucy, you know sauce. Um, and she was able to talk Mr. Spinelli into becoming a sauce manufacturer, but first she had to become a chef. And her passion was, was so deep, she didn't wanna hire a chef, she became a chef. So when you talk about someone who has her heart and her soul in the right place, she wants to feed people because this is what we do. She feeds people and she wants to nourish people and she wants to feed and nourish you. So Chris Rogers, take the floor. Thanks, Dad. Five minutes, please. <laughs> Hi, my name is Chris Rogers and I'm the owner of Spinelli Sauce Company. We're a Colorado-based pasta sauce and salad dressing company and we sell wholesale to supermarkets, gourmet grocery stores, and we also have an online presence through our website, and we sell our sauces online through Amazon as well. Our mission at Spinelli Sauce Company is to become a thriving national brand, with operating with the most integrity and passion for serving healthy, delicious food. Currently, we have four flavors of pasta sauce. We have a classic marinara, creamy tomato vodka sauce, our roasted garlic fra diavolo is our spicy, and we have a puttanesca, which is a classic sauce with capers, olives, and a little anchovy. We also have three flavors of dressings. We have a classic Caesar, a Italian gorgonzola, and a Mediterranean balsamico. We take pride in doing business with 
companies that have the same commitment we do to selling healthy premium products. Uh, we sell to Whole Foods, Natural Grocers, Vitamin Cottage. You can find us in the natural sections of King Super, Safeway, and other gourmet stores like Marzak Fine Foods <laughs> and Tony's. What sets us apart? First of all, the, our recipes are created by a certified chef, myself. Um, and that really gives us the restaurant quality flavor that you don't find in other sauces and dressings that you can buy on the shelf in the grocery stores. We use the highest quality ingredients. We use extra virgin olive oil, fresh onion, fresh garlic. And the tomatoes that we buy are the most amazing tomatoes that you can possibly purchase. They're naturally ripened, so they're naturally sweet. We don't have to add sugar, unlike 99% of the other sauces out there who add sugar so that their sauces don't taste like cardboard. Ours taste like delicious tomatoes. <laughs> so our, some of our successes, we have a diverse and loyal customer base. We have distribution through national companies like UNFI, DPI, and KEHI. This will allow us to grow to other states in the country. Um, we're currently in a, a little over 300 stores. Uh, 2014, our sales revenue was 335,000, and first quarter of 2015, our sales were up about 12%. Our growth strategy, we are going to double our in-store sales. Those are the sales for the stores that we're currently in. So right now, we're selling four jars a week. We'll be selling eight jars a week. We're going to expand to other regions. We're pretty saturated in the Rocky Mountain region here. Um, we want to, we're started saturating the southwest region. We're going to head to the west coast, northwest, northeast, and southern regions as well. We have lots of new products, new recipes that we want to introduce. Um, we have an awesome pizza sauce and an Alfredo sauce that we're excited to bring forth. And also, we want to expand into the food service market, selling our sauces and dressings to restaurants, ski resorts in bulk, things like that. Looking at our financial projections, the end of 2015, we're aiming to sell over 11,000 cases of sauce, and by the end of 2017, bringing that to over 25,000 cases of sauce annually, and an annual sales revenue of over a million dollars by the end of 2017. What are we asking? We're asking for a $150,000 investment. Ideally, this would be an equity investor who can bring expertise um, to help us achieve our growth strategy. What are we going to use the money for? We're going to amp up our demos and marketing. Um, we're going to hire brokers that will allow us to get our sauces in the mouths of buyers in other regions, um, expand our product line with new recipes and um, of sauces and dressings and all that. Also, we need working capital and debt service. Why invest in Spinelli Sauce Company? I personally bring over 20 years of culinary and grocery experience. Our products are amazing, which you're about to taste samples of. And um, this is a really exciting time for us. Kroger um, has just committed to bring in, in our dressings to the Rocky Mountain region, to the refrigerated produce sets. And uh, Southwest Whole Foods is going to bring in our pasta sauces by the end of the 2015. So, thank you for listening to my pitch. And um, anybody have any questions? Or <laughs> Excellent. Big round of applause. <clears throat> the first time I heard her talk about those tomatoes, I was like <laughs> having tomato envy. Went to my backyard to my tomato plants, and they're not producing any fruit for me yet, and now I'm really annoyed. However, you get to taste her yumminess right now. Oh, this is our Caesar's <laughs> dressing on a little Caesar salad, and we also have a creamy tomato vodka sauce with just a little bread for drip dipping. Don't you all wish you were on the School of 30? Because I wish I was on the School of 30. <laughs> Any of you hiring so that I could be on the School of 30 next time around? I'm just, you know. Anyway. OK. Um, questions for Chris? Questions for Chris? Yes? Could you talk a little bit about the uh, competitive environment, particularly in, uh, this to, to retail establishments like Whole Foods? Who are the biggest um, sellers in your categories there? And how far behind are you? Okay, so he's looking, you're looking for the biggest sellers in the retail environment and how far behind is she? Yeah. Or where I am. Where you are. 
Yeah, yeah where I think we're in a whole stage that kind of Right. Well, that's a great question. And as you know, anybody who's ever been to the grocery store, there's a million products out there. And the competition is huge. And we've been really fortunate that Colorado is one of the states where they really have started celebrating local. So Whole Foods has been our bread and butter as far as that goes. And they have really helped promote our pasta sauces. And they love us because you know, we are local and we're, we're right in line with what the other, you know, they're all natural and gourmet and delicious. But uh, that being said, there's a lot of gourmet sauces out there. Um, so yeah, as far as going to other regions and then addressing that competition and not being local anymore, we found that the best way that we can really take that on is when we demo our products and we offer samples and we get people to try them, they almost always buy them and they become repeat customers. Um, and so doing demos and things like that helps us get ahead of our competition. Um, we are at a $6.99 manufacturer suggested retail price, which is you know kind of a little pricier than most, but not as pricey as some of the other ones. But we do find that by getting people to grab them off the shelf, that really helps us get ahead of our competitors. How many tastings can you do? Do you, is it, well, can you do that in every market? Well, it's, it requires a lot of money. Yeah. <laughs> so we recently just have started doing them down in Texas. Um, we're in central market stores there, which are a really gourmet driven um, food company. And when we do demos, our sales go up 40%, 40 to 50%. Mm -hmm. Um, people try them, they love them, so, but we have to pay for the demos. Certainly. And that's why I'm saying, give us your money. Throw me some money. Throw us some money. Um, okay, so we're going to go one, two, three, and then four. Our margins? Uh, the gross margin on the pasta sauce right now is at about 15%. Uh, and the dressings, which we, we really just launched at the end of last year, and 2015 has been, it's been growing steadily. Those margins are about 20%. Matt? Uh, the 463 in 2015, uh, is, that, is, is that counting on in-person, or is that? Well, so. Um, Hold on a second. So I got to oh, repeat sorry. the question. So is the, say, say it again. Is your estimate of income uh, at over 450, um, do you require the 150 investment in order to get to what your current 2015 target is? Do you require the 150 investment to get to your target? Right, for 2015. For 2015. Actually, the um, 2015 sales revenue projection was based on a 25% assumption, um, which our 2013 to 2014 um, was 25% growth. Um, and so I decided to keep that at 25% because I don't know how long it will take to get money. But so we did a 25% assumption for 2015, and then going forward, 2016 and 2017, we did a 50% assumption. Okay. Patrick? Uh, talk about your production capabilities. And, and, and again, I guess the question I have, talk about the production capabilities, but to me, what you're, is 150,000 really enough uh -huh. for what you're projecting? So the question right. is, what are your production capabilities, and is $150,000 really enough? Right. Um, our production capabilities are huge because we use a co-packer that helps us manufacture our sauces. Um, currently, we are manufacturing our dressings ourselves, but I have a co-packer in line once we bring in the Kroger account because that's going to add 10 times our sales that we're doing now. Um, and so, yes, uh, as far as production ca capabilities, I feel like sky's the limit with that. Um, and as far as $150,000, that number is based on, um, like last year we spent 4% on marketing. Um, and so I would like to double our marketing expense to 8%. So that's with that and then the, ex, you know, the added revenue that's going to come from all the wonderful marketing and the brokers and everything like that, we will have more money to operate and things like that. But $150,000 is a number that we, we came up with based on crunching numbers and past expenses and what we think going forward for the next few years. Okay. Peter? Uh, that was mine. That was yours. Yes? Of your existing uh, growth, how much came from increased sales 
same store sales versus new outlets? Okay, how much of your growth came from same store sales versus new outlets? Um, that's a great question, and we have, we're constantly increasing our sales in existing markets. Um, it was sort of amazing to me. Um, I actually consulted with the marketing person here at the Small Business Development Center, and she helped me come up with a plan for amping up our social media, which, you know, of course now everything is about social media. And <laughs> that made such a huge difference in our in-store sales that it was mind-boggling to me. And so um, we, we are constantly experiencing growth in store sales. I have a broker here locally who keeps track of like sales in Whole Foods and natural grocers and um, yeah, he says it's growing, growing, growing. And I don't know if it's because people are becoming more familiar with our product, but so that's why I know that if we can get money to s start expanding to other regions, I mean, we'll just, the sky's the limit as far as the growth for this company. Ah, so what kind of ownership percentage are you willing to give up for the 150,000? Right. Well, and that's a hard question. I, you know, I personally would love to keep control of my company. I mean, I started it and I'm, I nurtured it and it's growing. It's her and, baby. <laughs> right. But I am willing to entertain any opportunity. Um, and I would be willing to, uh, in order to do that, in order to keep the majority ownership, um, maybe structure it so some are loans and some is equity for the money. Okay, I'm looking for a mix there. Mm -hmm. um, because you did, you did mention you're also looking for money that comes with expertise. Yes, exactly. And, and that's what I mean by, it would depend on what the situation is, who can bring what to the table and, you know, and, and look at it from having the knowledge of what's coming in and what's gonna be brought to the table, so. Great. Other questions? Yes. Can you talk about how much discounting you've had to do in for your product? You, you've had to give away at the beginning with the big chains and the distributors? Um, um, wait, how much discounting <laughs> have you had to do and how much product have you had to give away to get in with the big chain realtors? Or realtors? <laughs> the big well, chain stores. <laughs> right, and, and that uh, goes back to what I was saying about how wonderful it is to be a Colorado business locally. The big chains, King Supers, Safeway, they haven't required any sort of free fill or anything like that. As we expand, um, Whole Foods, you know, they'll bring us into every new store they open up. And Natural Grocers actually is up to 100 stores now. They take a 50% discount for free fill every time they open a new store. Um, I know that once I start expanding to Kroger nationally and things like that, there's uh, free fills that you're going to have to market or, you know, pay for and things like that. But we've been really fortunate so far. So um, I haven't actually worked those numbers in, but I know with the added revenue that sort of helps take care of those free fill costs. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, you had one more question? Have you um, been a part of Naturally Boulder? Have you been a part of Naturally Boulder? I have not. I, I'm not sure what that is. You might look into that group. It's a group of the natural and organic food companies, uh, for specifically up in Boulder, but it's a really tight-knit group of folks who've been there and done that uh, in a lot of different categories. It might be helpful for you as well. And Great. it's called Naturally Boulder? Naturally Boulder. Okay, so the Thank advice you. from the floor to check out Naturally Boulder. Um, that Great. could be a good partner or yeah. source of information. Um, last question from Matt, and then we're going to go to Aaliyah. <laughs> it's hard for me to talk about an exit just because, like I said, I love what I do and this is my baby and I've nurtured it and it's growing, growing, growing. However, realistically, I would love to uh, bring the company to a point of profitability and thriving that um, it makes it attractive for either a merger with another successful existing company or a sale ultimately. Um, from another company that sees how awesome we are and needs to have us. I, I think I always think it's interesting. We, my husband and I, often work with female entrepreneurs, and 
this exit question is a really tough one. Um, a lot of times women may look at business differently and how they operate their businesses. However, um, when kids turn 18, you want them out of that house. So <laughs> I'm just saying talk to her. She's going to get to the point where she's got to kick them out and send them off to college. Uh, Aaliyah, what do you got for me? Do you have any ideas of how you could increase your profit margin? Yes. <laughs> Actually, um, we are working on um, transitioning from 12 packs to six packs of our sauce. Um, and we have, um, we're in the middle of working with our co-packer analyzing prices. So we will actually uh, be able to increase profit margin by increasing our prices with the six pack as opposed to the um, 12 pack. And also, um, when you're doing higher and higher volumes, you can get better prices on ingredients and things like that, which also um, reduce costs and help with profitability. And um, any kind of increased sales will always help with pro profitability as well. Wonderful. Thank you, Chris. Can Another I do one, one more? Yes, Dafna? please, go for and it. And then I have a note from uh, oh, downstairs. From downstairs, uh oh. Yes. From Are the you tank. using Colorado growers for your ingredients? I know you love to brag about this. Are they organic, non-GMO, no preservatives, all glass jars, and what's the shelf life? Okay. Um, we try to source Colorado businesses as much as we can. Unfortunately, our tomatoes, which are the primary ingredient in our pasta sauces, come from Stanislaus, which is a company out of California. But we have tasted a million tomatoes, and they are the best. Um, but as far as local, um, you know, onions, spices, uh, labels, everything like that, we source everything else locally. Um, our uh, shelf life on our pasta sauces is two years, and on our dressings, actually, um, they're six months. Um, they're our refrigerated product, um, but we have a, a nice shelf life on them. And... Um, Glass jars, yes, but we are also looking at different kinds of packaging that are uh, for, especially when we go into food service, things like that, um, packaging in plastic uh, biodegradable bags um, and doing uh, different kinds of packaging for different kinds of opportunities. Did I answer all the questions? Yes. Excellent. Okay. Big <laughs> round of applause for Chris. You get to breathe now, Chris. And Aaliyah, what's the can message? I, can I steal a moment? Yeah, please. So I wanted to remind you all that our mobile app is up and running. And uh, as you can imagine, since we've had three, we have you know three that are in the lead right now. Uh, but I'm only seeing about $3 million allocated out of- Oh, uh, you're not uh, allocating your money, yeah, people. 200 million out there that are that are watching. <laughs> so I'd like to remind you, I'm, I'm gonna spell out the, the app again. This is also a great place for you to leave your comments for the presenter. You can also opt yes or no, do you want to be contacted by this presenter? So School of 30, great opportunity for you. That link is tankevent.com. That's tankevent.com. And the password is Trout Tank Guest. TTG. Capital. capital T, capital T, capital G. Trout Tank Guest. But this is another opportunity. Don't go anywhere because for our next segment, the sponsor are the cash prize sponsors. And the cash prize sponsors are all of you. Um, remember that we are crowdfunding this cash prize sponsor, this cash prize tonight, from you here in the audience. And Aaliyah, can you tell us what is that website that we can go to where we can make a, a quick five, ten dollar, ten thousand dollar donation <laughs> to this prize? Whatever, whatever you're feeling, you're feeling ben benevolent, aren't you, Cedric? He's benevolent. Well, He's benevolent. So we, we, I got to point out that Robin and Paul here in the second row already committed two hundred dollars. Oh. Yes, thank um, you, Robin and Paul. Big old round of applause for Commerce Bank. That's right, Commerce Bank. <laughs> And we've got Rockies Venture Club and Colorado Enterprise just trailing them. Um, you can make your pledge at bit.ly L-Y slash Trout Tank Pledge. You can also make a pledge using the pledge card in front of you. That's fifth floor and fourth floor. There's a little pledge card in front of you. You can write your amount. And I had one guy come up to me and ask, can I donate my time as a developer worth $1,000? Sure. And I said, heck yeah, you yeah, can. Yeah, absolutely. Bring it on. In kind is welcome here. All right, thank you so much for that, Aaliyah. 
Oh my goodness, we went through three pitches already. Can you believe it? And we are finally at our last pitch of the evening, which is Corbin Cowan. And Corbin started um, supporting and being a business owner when he was at CU and he was raising funds for business way back then and in his college days. Um, and through his company, CXO Collective, really believes in supporting the entrepreneur in the community. And as he supports the entrepreneur, he knows that he's creating that wealth that helps support all of the other elements of our community. Corbin himself is a person who is committed to tithing. So he is often com contributing to our community. So when you invest in Corbin, you are investing in our community. So so please welcome Corbin Cowan and five minutes on the clock. Thank you. Uh, tonight we're going to talk a little bit about CXO Collective's mobile device repair uh, business opportunity. Um, I don't know about you, but I've got three kids and so I see this cracked screen a lot. And this cracked screen has really um, birthed a, an entire industry in the mobile device repair business. Uh, this is now a, a projected to be over a billion dollar um, industry in, in 2015, and it's growing at about a 4.9% clip. Uh, smartphone penetration right now is over 100% in the United States. So in other words, everybody has at least one cell phone uh, smartphone device in their home, and many people have more than one. Uh, tablet penetration, your, 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 your notebooks and your, your you know, iPads, is now eclipsing over 30%. Of, of the US population. So we've got a tremendous amount of uh, electronic devices that have uh, glass screens, that have buttons, that have power supplies that are constantly being broken. And these are not cheap devices. These are not your uh, $100 flip phones. These are $800 and $1,000 devices. So CXO Collective is bringing to together three really powerful forces. One, this incredible uh, new up and coming business opportunity, together with Solaris, which is a world class. Uh, retailer, and I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about them in a, in a little bit. And of course, the world's largest retailer in Walmart. Who is Solaris? Solaris uh, is one of the uh, leading franchisors in the country. Uh, and this is a classic entrepreneur success story. A couple of brothers and a buddy decided that they would go out and they would get uh, mobile device accessories from China and, and put a kiosk in the mall and see if they could sell them. And so they, they bought a whole, whole lot and, per, and sold them out in about two weeks. So they decided to do, do it again, sold out in two weeks again. And so they decided to open up another one in the mall down the street. And pretty soon, their friends were opening them, and, and they had multiple locations all across uh, this, the state of Georgia. And so in 1994, they decided to franchise. Now they've got over 600 franchisees across the country in, this, in specifically uh, every mall in America. And of course, you take a world-class franchisor and you put them in inline store within Walmart, you've got really a one-of-a-kind one um, franchise opportunity. We feel like the timing is perfect right now. There's absolutely no dominant player in the space. Uh, it's primarily made up of a lot of mom and pops that have absolutely no ability to, to warranty the work that they're doing on, on these $800,000 devices. And who knows what they're doing to that device when they take it in the back room. Right, you, you bring it in and, and you've got a counter in the back room and they take your device with all of your contacts and all of your passwords and all of your stuff and, and who knows what's going on. Um, there's just not the reputation with these mom and pops that come with having a, an inline store in Walmart. And we feel like Solaris, together with Walmart, is perfect to take over and dominate this space. So what does this alliance with Walmart really mean? Enormous in-store, uh, uh, en enormous foot traffic. Um, in-store promotions that, that are unique to the Solaris opportunity. Uh, universal re recognition, not only do, does everybody know um, who Walmart is, everybody more importantly for us knows where Walmart is. So when we're marketing to the consumer, we don't have to tell them that we're behind the, you know, uh, Jimmy John's across the street from, from the AT&T store, we just say we're, we're at Walmart on 5th and everybody knows where to go. This is a, ultimately a $100 million opportunity uh, thousands of locations, there's 3,000, over 3,000 uh, Walmart super centers across the country. Um, and, and of course, partnering with, with Walmart is a, is a huge opportunity. What we're really looking for is, uh, we've already deployed a, over a million dollars into to the Colorado community with this opportunity. Uh, we're looking for an additional $450,000 uh, to open up five additional locations, uh, either in, in throughout the Front Range uh, or other communities uh, across the country. Um, the use of proceeds is, is to, to do everything that we need to do to get the five stores up and going 
inventory build out, execution strategic, strategic plan, marketing support, everything. Um, this is a projected uh, distribution. Uh, this, this shows um, distributions uh, going to the investors, having 125% return to the investors within three years. And, and so uh, you can see that, that break even is somewhere around eight to nine months before we're actually uh, creating profitability. Management team is myself. More importantly, Jason Myers, who is the former chief operating officer of Singular Wireless. We're bringing serious Fortune 50 talent to this opportunity. So if you're interested, this is how you can get in touch with me. Thank you. A big round of applause for Corbin. I'm not saying that I've broken three phones, but you know, I'm saying that I've you know smashed three phones, and it's really no fun at all, and um, it's no fun for my husband. Hi, honey. <laughs> He's right out there. <laughs> anyway, um, so questions for Corbin? Anybody need their phone fixed? Rob. What is the price point for fixing these devices per screen or could it be your other services? Um, I'm going to repeat the question. What is the price point for fixing these products, a screen or other devices? Uh, it depends on on. The, uh, the age of the device, but anywhere from $79 to $129 generally. Average ticket price in currently is, is right at, a, at $100. I have to do School of 30 first, but then I'll get to you out there in the audience. Excellent. Matt, Cedric, Dunwin, Scott. <laughs> okay, Matt. <laughs> Okay, so Matt wants to know what kind of terms you're going to get from a Walmart store and how competitive is that, knowing that other businesses have gone out of business trying to do business with Walmart. So the, the people that have gone out of business doing business with Walmart are our vendor relationships. We are not a vendor relationship. Uh, we are a tenant relationship. So we are renting real estate within Walmart. Uh, and so they don't control our price points. They don't control our margins. They don't control anything within, within our, the walls of our store. And so we feel like that that is a, c a competitive advantage. And what we're doing to, to enhance the Walmart relationship is we're doing things like training their uh, actual staff to sell the electronics devices and, and things like that back in the back of the store. And in exchange for that, they're giving us uh, complete access to market to the customers. Normally when, uh, when a tenant relationship exists like ours, you have to wait till they cross your boundaries into, to, into your space to market to them. They're letting us put signage up. They're letting us put people out in the, in the, in the you know, cashier, you know, handing out things. And, and so we're doing all, all the things that we can to enhance that relationship. Are you doing that gratis? Are you having to pay for the ability to do that? Do you have to pay to have those people we, out there? We do not have to pay. To, I mean, we have to pay the people that are out there, you know, sure, yeah. they're, they're on our payroll, but, um, but they're not looking for it like that. They're, no. Cedric. Talk about how you're going to compete against that technology when it does come out. Uh, please talk about the technology and how you might compete once shatterproof glass hits the market. Is that a real thing, shatterproof? Because, you know, I want to see that. Yeah, it's a real thing. Okay, so how are you going to compete if shatterproof hits so the market? Th th that's, that's actually a very common question, but we've got uh, about five years of runway on the existing devices that are already made um, before that even becomes a problem. Um, the other way that we're competing against that is that we're, we're moving from just mobile device uh, repair into computer repair. Essentially, uh, the discussions that we're, we're having with Walmart is that they would like us to replace the Geek Squad or bury the Geek Squad, as, as, as they say. Um, and so um, moving to literally servicing everything uh, electronic that, that Walmart sells in the back of the store. Bury the so Geek expand, Squad. So expanding the business model. Uh, dramatically. Burying the Geek Squad sounds a little violent. Um, Scott and then Peter. Um, and then. I've got a couple questions. Um, last night I went online and did a little research and found out that uh, um, you, your company is in many, many Walmarts. Can you talk about the profitability of each store and you know where you reach break even and then where you start to make money as well as the product mix that you sell? Okay, so how can you talk about the profitability that you're already seeing in the stores and the profit mix? So these are from Solaris's that are already in Walmarts. Um, so the, the existing stores that are within Walmart under the Solaris brand are corporate stores. And so under franchise law, they can't actually divulge 
uh, the profitability numbers until uh, they issue an item 19, which has not happened yet. And so we are early adopters to this concept, but what, what they have been able to share with us is that those stores have, have reached profitability in eight to 10 weeks. Um, we're projecting eight months. And so we're being very conservative in, in, in how we've built our business model in order to, to deploy more money into marketing and things like that. Um, so I hope that answers your question. You, so really there's not statistics that we can provide in terms of um, the profitability of it as well as, as a T-Mobile customer, why do I come to Solaris rather than going to my T-Mobile store? If I can re repeat that. Um, so you don't have data on profitability, and as a T-Mobile customer, why would I go to a Solaris to fix my phone? We don't have Solaris-specific data on profitability. We have industry data um, based off of all the existing uh, retailers that are, are currently uh, utilizing this concept. Um, but specific Solaris in-store in Walmart, no. Um, and the second question was... Why would I go fix my T-Mobile phone with you? The majority of, of the carriers do not actually repair devices at um, their locations. Um, many of them are actually forbidden from uh, touching a, an Apple device. Uh, and so if a T-Mobile uh, person tries to fix an Apple device and breaks it, then they're responsible for it. And, and uh, you know, there's all sorts of issues there. Um, we're also using aftermarket glass and things like that to bring the price point down uh, where a T-Mobile, a Sprint, and those things, they have to use uh, complete um, manufacturer products. Mm -hmm. Peter, do you have a question? I do. Um, I think it's interesting that you bring up the G Spot. The times that I've actually had my screen fixed, a tech came to my office and sat at my desk and did it. Is that something you guys may employ uh, or will it always just be a, like a customer-facing retail type of approach? Okay, so Peter wants to know if it, there would be ever a time that a tech might actually come to his office and fix your phone, or are you always going to be only in the store model? Um, we're, we're very open to um, all, all you know, different business models and, and how we generate additional revenue, but uh, we feel like with 50,000 people walking by our retail outlet um, uh, per week that we should be able to, to generate and drive enough traffic into our, our locations to achieve plenty of profitability without having to go to, the, to your uh, location. And, 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 and to, to be honest, uh, your office may be one thing, but you know, I've gotten that question where people are going to their homes, and I, I don't know about you, but I'm pretty picky about who, come, you know, who comes, comes into, into my, my house. <laughs> um, did you have a question? Yep, so your question is about warranty, warranty of work or losing the warranty on the phone device? Specifically about the fact that I mentioned that warranty was an issue with ah, the, these other okay, mom so, and pops. Uh, great, so, bring it on. So um, we actually have an upsell product where um, if you buy one of our cases and a screen protector, um, we guarantee that if, if you break it at any point in time in the life of that phone, w we will replace um, and, and repair that device. Exactly. So it's both an additional uh, revenue source for us um, and, and also uh, an added benefit to the, to the client. Great. Can you talk about your franchise operating experience on your team? Can you talk about your franchise operating experience on your team, please? Um, well, Jason Myers um, was the chief operating officer for Singular Wireless, took him from 200 locations to, to 1,200 locations. Um, and we didn't get an opportunity to get into the CXO collective, uh, but we are a collective of um, C-level executives. We've got uh, multiple people on our team that have um, decades of franchise experience. The actual person that brought this deal to CXO collective um, is, is a legacy franchise group, and, uh, and so uh, that, that is a, a very valid question, but we've got multiple experts within that field. Yes and yes. Where is the investment that you're looking for going? Is it going into strategic equity partners? Is it going into CXO Collective? And then where is the money then going to go out? Is it going to go out to Solaris to pay for franchises? It's a special okay, so purpose entity. Wait, 
Where is the yes. money? Right? Where is the money coming from yes. and going to? Yes, go ahead. <laughs> so the question is: is the money that I'm asking for, where is it going? Um, Strategic Equity Partners is is the broker on this. Um, we have create CXO Collective has created a special purpose entity um, that will be owned by the equity participants of the five uh, locations, as well as um, any uh, and and the debt will come into that structure as well. And then it will uh, go out to Solaris uh, for the, the various build-out costs, so on and so forth. So since this is such an attractive and uh, fast-growing and profitable business, what barriers are in place that will prevent Walmart from developing their own Walaris sort of <laughs> Yes, yeah, so what barriers are in place uh, from Walmart taking over this concept and doing it on their own? Um, there, there are no barriers to Walmart creating anything. Um, Walmart is the, the, the third largest uh, employer in the world behind the Chinese government and the U.S. government. So, so to say that we're going to have a barrier for Walmart to do anything is, is completely ridiculous. But um, what, what, they're, what they look to do is they look to have people like us come in and prove a concept make sure that it's going to be successful, and then they're going to either buy it out or brand at Walmart, right? And so that's a potential exit strategy for us. Uh, we feel like once we get into 1,000 locations or, or even 500 locations, that those discussions can begin. Uh, Walmart doesn't even want to talk about that kind of stuff until you can prove your sauce, so to speak. Okay, and question from the back of the room. Okay, so how do you think you can compete uh, over you break, you fix it, places that have a market share in a neighborhood, for example? Did I cover that? Yeah. Yeah. So the, the actual, the, 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 the next, um, the biggest competitor in the space right now would be CPR, which has 125 locations across the country and in Canada. Um, you break, I fix is less than 100 locations across the whole United States. And so within six months of today, we'll eclipse You Break, I Fix uh, locations throughout the country. And we're on path on, you know, projected to do, to do 1,000 over the next 12 to 18 months. And so we feel like as, as we begin to um, go into the marketplace, we will uh, dominate the market share because of the marketing power that we have with, through Solaris and the, the partnership that we have with, with Walmart. Excellent. Aliyah, are there any questions from downstairs? There are no questions from downstairs, so I'll take one more in the room. Yep. Okay, so the question is, how will Walmart handle cannibalization of the sales of the screen protectors in cases that they carry in the back of the store? Um, that's, that's a great question. Uh, first of all, they, they sell practically, um, they, they sell very few screen protectors um, and, and cases in the back of their store. Their, their people are not trained to even sell them. However, um, we have, have been given a, 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 a limited access to sell that particular product. Uh, so we're not selling otter boxes. We're not selling a whole lot of things. We're selling custom cases with screen protectors, and we've given, been given the blessing from Walmart in order to do that. Um, any of the products that they carry in the back, we will um, actually sell them uh, at a 10% margin uh, for them, essentially, uh, or, or buy them at a 10% discount and, and sell them. And so we're, en we're enhancing um, their in-store sales by, by selling those products within our location as well. Excellent. Very good. Thank you so much, Corbin, for your time. Thank Big you. round of applause for Corbin. Okay, this is, this is um, first of all, we need to do another round of applause because all four of them were incredible. Incredible. And now we come to the really fun part of the evening. You got to allocate your million dollars. And so you want to go on to the website, and we're going to repeat that website. Uh, the website. Yes, the website is tankevent.com. Tankevent.com. Tankevent.com, and the password is Trout Tank Guest, so, all capital 
So while you're tank, going yes. through and doing that, sorry, trial tank S, capital T, capital T, capital G, you got it. Um, while you're going through and you're allocating, also think about, do you want to kick something in for that cash prize and put that on your pledge forms? Um, and we would really appreciate that. And so would the four incredible businesses that you heard about. And again, while you're working on allocating your cash prizes this evening, um, I want to let you know that our next event is going to be September 15th. And we hope to see all of you here. Um, a special invitation to our Trout Tank School of 30 and to our VIP guests up here and to everybody who's downstairs on the fourth floor, who we appreciate so much for participating and sending up questions this evening, as well as all of you out in the Googleverse. You are welcome to participate and be a part of Trout Tank in September. You can take a leading edge class here at the SBDC. You can meet with any one of our SBDC people to talk about how we can help you strengthen your businesses. And you can um, simply audition if you are a business that's been in business for two years or more and you want to just take our pitch uh, academy with Rocky's Venture Club. It's an incredible pitch academy. You will enjoy it and learn a lot no matter how many years you've been in business. So please take part of our expertise and then we'll have auditions that will be posted on the SBDC website a couple of months before our September 15th event. Once more that website is Tank Event and the password is Trout Tank Guest and I wanted to mention that we, we Yes, it's one word. And capital T, capital T, capital G. Yes, that's right. <laughs> We've collected some pledges from downstairs, and Lindsay's going to be coming around right now, so pass your pledges to the end of the rows, everyone. Uh, we're passing the cap, people. So far, <laughs> we we have collected $350 tonight in cash Woo! prizes, as well as Alec Brewster, who has donated $1,000 of of development and design. And that's $350 over the already committed. Get that's total. That's total. So we have $350 so far in our catch prize, plus $1,000 of in-kind services. And um, you were, we're going to close these uh, voting pretty soon. But so far, we have $21 million for Safe Ride for Kids in the first position here. So um, while we're waiting for those results to come in, I'd like to thank a few people who made pledges downstairs. Sari Circus, um, she was in our leading edge class. She's given back to her classmates now. Very good. Uh, Elizabeth Leader, John Kirkland, Brent Sutherland, and Michael Passante. So thank you so much to all of you downstairs who are pledging at this moment. And I think we're going to call that winner for Safe Ride for Kids. So and the winner is? Safe Ride for Kids. Can we give a big round of applause? <laughs> All right, come on up here, man. Uh, remember that all of our all of our contestants today of our of our fish are our little trout wannabes. They are all of our winners, and we hope that you will seriously consider how you might invest in these companies and you in our community. How you might connect with our small business owners to help them make the Colorado economy stronger. And with that, I'd like to call up Kelly Bruff to make a final statement from our glorious host, the Denver Metro Chamber of Commerce, Kelly Bruff. Thank you so much. That was great. Uh, I'm going to actually tell you what you can answer when somebody asks you, why do you call this trout tank? There's really two very simple reasons. Uh, there isn't an ocean in Colorado, <laughs> and we're nice, as exhibited by tonight's event. We're not sharks. Uh, congratulations to all four uh, who pitched, not only for having the courage to stand up in front and let us all criticize and judge, and, and ho hopefully you felt our support mostly, but also for doing business in Colorado. One more time to all of you. Thank you. I have to give a shout out to the sponsors too because we absolutely couldn't come together if you all didn't help make sure that we could underwrite and support this. So Colorado Lending Source, thank you so much. First Bank, you guys show up every single time we do something. Mission Yogurt, we're very proud to work with you, Rod. Thank you so much for tonight and Brainspire, truly appreciate it. You know, our job here is really very simple. We do one thing, we connect people. We connect them to opportunities, to jobs. Uh, we connect new ideas to sustainable business practices and models, and tonight we connected entrepreneurs to funding. Thank you so much for being part of it and for everything you're doing in Colorado to drive our economy. We really are the envy of the country, and we're very proud to be here with you. Have a great evening.
And with that, another trout tank comes to a close. We'll see you September 15th. Please hang around so our people downstairs can meet you and talk to you. And we'll see you outside in the lobby. Have a great night, everybody. <laughs> clap, clap, applause. It's wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>